God, isn't God good? Yes. Turn to somebody and look at them and say, you're the best looking thing next to me. <laughs> Some of you thought that a little differently, or you thought that through for a minute, you know, you thought you were the best looking, but, uh, you know, looks are deceiving. Somebody looked at me when I walked in here and they thought, oh, brother, look at this guy in a lime green shirt, whatever this thing he is got on here. But you know, God doesn't look at the outside of anybody. Isn't that awesome? I just love the fact that God doesn't look at us red, yellow, black, white, brown, pink, orange. I met Pinky in here a second ago, praise God. I'm telling you, I think as her name is Pinky. Where are you at? Wave at me, girl. Praise God. Kiki, pink. She didn't have anything pink on today, but, but I'm telling you, God loves people. God loves people. Can you say amen? And God loves you. God loves you. I believe that if we could get everybody in the world to understand that God loves them, we'd have cured about 99.9% .9 of all of the issues that we have in the earth. And so we're going to talk about some things today that will help get a revelation inside of you of how heaven sees you. How heaven sees you. Heaven sees you differently than you see you or anybody else sees you. Heaven sees you in a light that God says you are in. You've got to see things differently. You need to start thinking like Jesus thinks and talk like Jesus talks and walk like Jesus walks. Because if you have Jesus on the inside of you, you are a new creation and old things have passed away and all things have become new. And God wants you to think right. But there's some things that have to happen for you to think right. And one of those things is that you've got to... Anne's going to share a couple of some verses of Scripture with you for, for a minute here. But there's some things you've got to do which is you got to get full of God's Spirit. Amen. you gotta, you got to think differently. So I'm going to let Ann share, share a couple of verses, some verses of Scripture God laid on her heart, and then I'm going to take over again Hallelujah. and we'll... Thank you, Jesus. You know, the, the body of Christ is not a one-man show. Yeah. You all have a part in it. That's right, you do. And if you're not doing your part, the body's hurting. Yeah. So, and it's good to be a... a what did Barry Tubbs say? Second, second, backup man or backup woman, you know, because they need backup, backup. Your pastor needs backup. Your pastors need backup. And I, I'm part of a, a GLOW, it used to be Women's Aglow, and I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was one of the first organizations that brought the Spirit of God and the fullness of the Spirit in to uh, America. And um, I'm on a team, and I have a president. One time the president said, you all need to think about what we need to be doing in this aglow. And, you know, I prayed about it, and I thought about it, and I said, God, I can't think of anything we should be doing. And, and then it just hit me, why don't you back up your president? I said, I can do that. And so that became my goal in that organization to back up the president. Yeah. And, you know, the harmony and the love and the things that we get done now is amazing. And I've quit my complaining and seeing everything she does wrong, and I start supporting her. And, you know, your pastors have dreams that need to be fulfilled. Amen. And you guys are the ones that are going to make it happen. Yeah. So, you know, if you have to get a second job to, to help supply the need here at the church, let's get those dreams of your pastors fulfilled because they're from God. And your job is to back them up and make sure that it happens. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah? Amen. You thank you. Are you thankful for God the Father? Amen. Are you thankful for Jesus? Amen. Yes, I am. Are you thankful for the Holy Spirit? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And my, I wanted to share some things about the Holy Spirit you may have, you've been taught probably, but you may have forgotten. And I just want us all just pray in the Holy Spirit for a little bit. Yes, amen. Let's Hallelujah.
You know, you don't have to be interpreted. You can, we're just praying to God. It's not a message to anything but just God. So let's just pray in the Holy Spirit for Amen. a Amen. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit yet, before the day is over, you can be. Amen. And uh, if you don't know how to pray in the Holy Ghost right now, you can just start praying in English and say, Thank you, Jesus, and worship the Lord. So let's begin right now. Let's pray loudly. Everybody in here, just worshiping God. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come rule and reign. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be your holy Praise name, you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep praying. I'm going to read some things as you pray. You can pray quieter now, but just keep praying. You know what? There's a living stream inside of you, and it's the Holy Spirit. And as you pray in tongues, that living stream flows out of you, and it keeps fresh and renewed. Hallelujah. And it enriches your life spiritually, and you speak divine mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. And it makes you conscious of God's presence. Some of you just keep praying quietly. Hallelujah. This is a gateway to all the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. You want to win over sin and temptation? Pray in the Holy Spirit. You want to win the world to Jesus? Pray in tongues and be more conscious of the Holy Spirit than anybody else's opinion. You know, and when you walk up to somebody, you just pray in the Spirit. What can I say? What can I do to let them know Jesus loves them? Hallelujah. Pray in the Spirit. The other day, I, was, I decided I'd practice this for an hour. And I was just praying in the Spirit and praying in the Spirit. And we had, we had this um, kind of family situation just hit us in the face and kind of knocked us back. And I was praying in the Spirit. I didn't feel anything, but I thought, you know, it benefits us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Jude 11, I think it is, says, build yourself up in the Holy Spirit. And so this situation had just hit us really hard, set us back, you know. And I'm just praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord just in the middle of, you know, not having much emotion or anything about it, the Lord said, don't fear that man. Amen. And I said, hallelujah. That's the answer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How did I get that? I was letting the Holy Spirit pray through me. You know, when you uh, uh, cooperate with the Holy Spirit, once uh, the president of the Siglo and I had an argument, I said, we do the praying. She said, the Holy Spirit does the praying. I asked a previous president. She said, you're both right. Because we have to make our mouth move and let the Holy Spirit speak through us. And the Holy Spirit gives us the unction but he's speaking mysteries to us. And hallelujah, as I'm praying, I lost the little train right there. But um, as I was praying, then God put that thought in my mind and completely freed us up in that situation. You know, the devil tries to get you under his foot and keep you there and, and not let you up. Well, you just pray in the spirit and pew. You, you'll just figure out how to triumph and come over the top of him Amen. in the name Amen. of Jesus. You know, I put about four booklets into this little page, and I have two more of these pages if anyone wants it. But if you need encouragement, if you want to get over being mad, there was a time when Jimmy just got lost in the, oh, and I continued praying in the Holy Spirit till 2 in the, in the morning that night. It was so awesome, so wonderful. I thought, I'm going to get some more revelation. I'm going to get some more victory. I'm going to be in the Holy Spirit. I only want to speak what the Holy Spirit says to speak. You know, you have all kinds of thoughts that are going on. Say, no, thoughts line up with God. I want God's victory in my life and everyone's around me. Yes. Well, Jimmy was praying one time, and he just got, you know, there's all kinds of prayer that you do. You can do intercession. You can do war. All things that the Holy Spirit may, wants to do through you. He has more things planned for you than you can even imagine. And he's trying to stretch you and make you able to do that. The word expansion, keep, God keeps speaking to me. And, and I don't want to expand, but he keeps speaking expansion to me. And so i got to start expanding. But Jimmy was praying, and he just got lost in the Holy Spirit. It was a real time of intercession. He prayed for like three hours. Seven months later, he was starting up a new church and needed a sound system, and he just asked the Lord for it. And this lady a few, uh, shortly after drove up and said, the Lord said to bring, for me to bring this $700 to you, just what he needed. He had already gone down and picked out because the Lord said, go down and pick it out. And he said, well, I don't have any money. And the Lord said, he said, this is, 
thank you, Lord. And he said, well, you asked me for it a long time ago. And he said, I did? He said, yeah, remember when that you had that intercession? Your spirit knew that you were going to need that ahead of time? So I'm just answering that prayer. I'm, I'm a little slow even, but you were slow knowing you needed it. So hallelujah. Thank God for the Holy Spirit and the things we can do with it. You know, I think in this end time, you know, the people of Babel were uh, separated because it said they could do anything they wanted because they had one language and one purpose. You know, we are the church of God, and we have this one language in common. And if we get in unity and we start using this language, there's nothing that's going to stop us. We're going to be the bright and spotless bride of Christ that he's looking for. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Isn't God good? Is this yours? No. Okay. Well, God is good, man. I'm telling you, it's wonderful when God gets a Holy Ghost woman and she's so filled with the fire of God that she just keeps me stirred up, man. I'm telling you. She just... It's amazing how that we as human beings have perception and think a, think a lot of different directions. That's why Anne is so intense about praying. This is a, I, God gave me the most praying woman I could have ever asked for. She prays in the Holy Ghost and God moves. And I, I think that half of what goes on with me being when I get to preaching, I think half of what happens with my preaching is that she's been praying for me. And as we pray for one another, God will do supernatural things. But we have to, we have, to have perception and so many of us would like to have more power in our life, but we're like the little kid with the battery acid. The little boy was sitting on a sidewalk holding a bottle of battery acid one day. And this priest came by. He saw him had this bottle of clear liquid. And he said to him, he said, what you got there in that bottle? And he said, I've got battery acid. Well, the priest being a good man that he was, he said, oh, he said, I need to get that from you son and he says oh no he said I don't want to let go of this he said oh but that's powerfully dangerous stuff and he said I know that's the reason I got it he said well he said I'll tell you and so the priest is thinking for a minute and he said uh, he said how would you like to have something more powerful than that and the little boy he said oh I'd love to have something more powerful than that he said well I have some holy water here and he pulled out this little flask of holy water and he said this is holy water the little boy goes, what's so powerful about that? The priest thought for a moment, and he said, well, there was a woman who was in labor, and she couldn't pass the baby, and so he said, I dripped some of this on her, and she passed the baby. He said, that's nothing. I dripped some of this on a cat's tail, and he passed a Harley Davidson going 60 miles an hour. We all want the power, but we got to listen to what God wants us to know. See, power without understanding is not good for our life. If you got a Bible, I love the fact that I get to preach off of a Harley Davidson portion of a motorcycle up here. Man, this is awesome. I love this. I may, I may not stay up here very long. I'm, I'm kind of a person that I get around a lot and wander around a lot and do a lot of different things, so I may not stay up here. Listen, I want to avail a couple things to you back there. If you can't afford them, you just talk to us about it, and we'll work it out so that you can have these things. But Anne's got a message called Everything's All Right. This is a story of a woman who, when her son died, she kept saying everything's all right. See, God expects us to start ordering our conversation right so that we know that everything's all right. And if you have need of knowing that everything's all right, you, you need to, who in here is going through a struggle that you need to know that something, everything's all right? All right, there you go. You, you listen to that. That'll minister to your soul. And this is the glorious resurrected Christ. Some people don't even know what Jesus has done for us. See, did you know that more happened after Jesus was raised from the dead? More happened when Jesus was raised from the dead in between the time he was raised from the dead, went to heaven, and then the day of Pentecost, more things took place than what's written in the Word of God. Now, there's nothing in this message here that will tell you anything except what is in the Word of God. 
But I'm going to tell you that there's so much that's hidden in the treasure of the Word of God. The Word of God is filled with treasure. And this tells the story of what Jesus did from the time He raised from the dead till the day of Pentecost took place. And why He did what He did is so that you and I can have the power of the glorious resurrected Christ in our life. He wants us to live so powerfully and so resurrected. Brother, you take that home, you play that for your wife, and don't you let her miss a word of it. And you let God minister supernaturally into her. And if the rest of you want some of that, you can come out and to the tape table out there and be blessed. But I want to encourage you to get the Word of God. It's imperative that you hear, hear. Your pastor is a great pastor. Pastor, De pastor Bob and Debbie are absolutely awesome pastors. And I love being around them, praise God. Man, you know, they're real, and, and they hear God, and they listen to the voice of God. And, and, you know, as you get the word that they have preached, you know, sometimes what happens is we in congregations sit underneath of a pastor, and we think, oh, that was a great message. Well, when was the last time you re-listened to what the great messages were that your pastors preached? So I want to encourage you, re-get a hold of those messages that you get a little inkling. Oh, yeah, I remember when he preached something like that. Oh, yeah, maybe I ought to get a hold of this. So you get their messages, and you listen to the Word of God, and as you listen to the Word of God, God will intervene inside of every circumstance that Satan could hurl against you. I want us to pray real quickly, and I want you to agree with me that God's going to put inside of you what God wants inside of you, because it's not God's will that anybody doesn't know what God intends for them to be living like. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you right now for the anointing of the Holy Ghost on us. We thank you that the Holy Ghost power has already been in this place because it's inside of us. And we release the anointing of your life, Lord God, out of every one of us in this place. And we let the power of God come down into the Word. That as we speak and as I speak the Word of God, you telling me what to say. That lives are going to be changed, bodies are going to be healed, Satan's power is going to be stopped. And Father, there's going to be a supernatural thing will take place in this building today that will shake the very foundations of this portion of Missouri with the hand of your life and your love. And we covenant we'll give you all the honor and the thanksgiving and the praise in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. If you can agree with that, say amen. amen. Open your Bibles up to the book of, Colo uh, to book of Philippians, please. I want to share something with you. Every one of the songs that we sang this morning went right along with the message that God had given me to preach, and I was going, oh, this is wonderful. The Lord said, well, that's because I flow together. I told Brother Hagin one time, I said, Brother Hagin, he, he got up and he ministered something. I said, oh, Brother Hagin, I said, that was awesome. I said, that's exactly what I've been preaching. He said, well, it better be. It's the same Holy Ghost. If we're not saying the same thing, it's because we're not listening to what God's saying. we got division in the body of Christ because we're not listening to what the Holy Ghost is saying. Well, hold your place here in the book of Philippians and go with me over to the book of Luke for just a minute. I, I'm going to start this out a little differently. The Lord just prompted me. He said, I want you to start this out a little differently. I want you to go over to Luke, to the second chapter. I want to read some verses of Scripture to you. Luke, second chapter. If you don't have a Bible, make sure you've got a Bible to look at. Of course, I think we got able to shoot Scriptures up on the screen, which is awesome, except for a lot of people forget to write it in their own Bible themselves or mark it down or do something with it. Let's start in verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Be terribly afraid, for behold, I bring you bad tidings of terrible misery, which shall be to all people. <laughs> I've listened to some preachers get up and preach, and I think sometimes that must be what they're th reading. They say, God wants you sick, God wants you poor, God doesn't care about you. He's up there with a big club hitting you in the head and telling you what a terrible person you are. Well, nobody had to tell me when I was a terrible person that I was a terrible person. Somebody said, oh, you mean you're not a terrible person anymore? No, I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away and all things became new. Let's read it the way it's written. 
He said, and the angel said, Fear not. Fear not. Man, that message ann has got on that CD out there. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Fear not. For unto you... Oh, I love this. He says, those angels said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Amen. Not some, all. Everybody. Man, I love it. God not a respecter of persons. He died for everybody. He didn't just die for me. He didn't just die for you. He died for everybody. And then it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And He shall be a sign unto you, and you shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth... All kinds of misery and destruction and terrible things and no goodwill toward anybody. No, no, let's read it the way it's written. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Look at the person next to you and say, peace be unto you. Say it, on, say it to the person on the other side of you, peace be unto you. I'm going to get out my glasses. I wrote so small in my own Bible, I can't even read it. Peace be unto you. Now, the word peace in the Hebrew in the Greek language, coming out of the Greek, and uh, coming over into the Greek is the word shalom, but it's the word that means prosperity and blessing and health and victory and joy and life and everything that possibly could be good on the face of the earth. Peace be unto you, and good, good will toward men. Ephesians 1, 6 says, When you get born again, you're accepted in the Beloved. Amen. You're accepted. One of the struggles that we have is that we don't see ourselves like heaven sees us. When heaven looks at you, it's looking at you with a destiny that is preordained by God that you're supposed to be what heaven says you are. Now, not everybody's going to become what heaven says they are because they aren't doing what it takes to get to the place to be able to do what God says they are. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 5, you can just mark these down. You need, don't need to go to them, but it says... When we are in faith, we have peace. We have prosperity, we have joy, we have life, we have health, we have all those things. When we're in faith, faith is a substance. It's more real than anything there is around you. You're sitting on molecules that create substance, but actually they're not solid. Faith is solid. It's the only real thing there is. But you and I, when we sit down or we walk in a building or anything, we're surrounded by molecules that we think, boy, I'm standing on solid ground now. You know, somebody says, boy, that's a good solid floor. No, it's not. The molecules in this floor right now are moving. If they weren't, then it would cease to exist because anything that doesn't move is non-existent. The molecules in here are moving. Molecules in your body are moving. Molecules in the air are moving. Everything around you is moving, but that's not reality because there's this realm that we live in is a molecular moving structure. And so if you and I are going to live like God intends us to live and be what God intends us to be, we've got to live by faith. Faith is a substance, Hebrews the 11th chapter says. It's the faith is a substance of things hoped for. Hope is futuristic. Faith is now. Everybody say, faith is now. You can't believe faith five seconds from now. Faith is now. It's present tense. It's right this moment. So if you're going to live by faith and I'm going to live by faith, we've got to have something inside of us 
that makes us live like God says we are. Amen. This has just come alive to me recently more than ever any other time in my life of who God says I am. I was in Brother Copeland's meeting the other night down in Branson. There was a young man standing behind me. And I turned around and I looked at him and I said, Do you believe the prophets? He said, Yes, sir. I said, Well, I'm a prophet. Now, 20 years ago, I would have never said that even though God told me what I was. But I had to begin to say I was a prophet because that's how heaven sees me. Heaven sees you not as a welder or a house builder or a truck driver or a housewife or, 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 you know, that's a bad terminology in our politically correct days or whatever, I don't know. But God doesn't see you in those veins of light. He doesn't see you as a teacher in a public school system or He doesn't see you. He might see you as a teacher in the body of Christ. But God has gifts in the body of Christ and God sees you the way heaven declares that you are. And what you've got to do is you've got to get a hold of what God says you are and you need to begin to say what God says you are. Amen. It was a couple of months ago and I heard this prophet of God from England and he started talking about begin to see yourself as who God says you are. Start looking at yourself in the light of what heaven says you are. And the Word of God that comes alive to you and means something to you, meditate on that kind of scriptures, and it's beginning to tell you who you are, what you are, what you really do, how you really function. And so, what we've got to do is we've got to have a mindset change that tells us that we're different than what everybody around us tells us we are. We've all been told we were losers from the time we were all little kids. I mean, you know, you dirty little rotten stinking, you know, and, and kick you in the face or whatever, you know, or tell you how ugly you were, or, you know. And I used to practice that. I used to stand in front of the mirror and look at myself and say, Well, you are the ugliest thing I've seen. And some of you are listening right now. You stand in front of the mirror and instead of, instead of doing what God says you are, which God says how beautiful are the feet of them, my feet are even pretty. <laughs> and you get up in front of that mirror and you start working and you say, Ah, don't let it come out of your mouth. You're supposed to look at yourself and say, God says you're the righteousness... I remember the first time I ever said that to myself, I was the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hair stood up all over the back of my neck. I was standing there and I looked in the mirror and I'd gotten a revelation that I was the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, I pointed my finger and I scared myself. I pointed my finger and I said, You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And hair went up all over my neck and I ran away and my flesh goes, Don't do that again. You're who God says you are. If you'll become who God says, if you'll become, now listen to what I'm saying, if you'll become who God says you are. Now go with me back over to the book of Philippians, please, where I told you to be. We're going to dissect some scripture here real quickly. I want us to begin in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let, let, let. Notice that first word. Everybody say it with me. Let. Everybody say it again. Let. let. Now in our society, if we say, well, just let that lay there, that's permissional. But in this verse of Scripture, this particular Greek word is not permissional, it's a command. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
But the verse ahead of that says, Let, if any man be in Christ, let him be a new creation. Let him be what he's supposed to be. And that same word is used in the Greek language, which isn't permissional, it's a command. So let's read this verse in Colossians, or Philippians, the second chapter, verse 5. Let this mind, it's a commandment, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now I always associated verse 5 with verse 6, which says, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now I always thought that those two verses, the, I was reading that the other day, and I was reading it, and it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now that word let means to take a, lo a yoke upon you just like Jesus did. In, in the book of Matthew, in the 11th chapter, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is something that is not just one, but it, 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 creates a, it creates a pulling effect. And the Holy Spirit, that's why prayer, prayer in the Holy Ghost is so important. You know, the Apostle Paul said, I thank my God I pray in tongues more than you all in, in 1 Corinthians 14. But the reason he did that was because he, he, under, he wasn't being braggadocious. He was trying to get people to understand if you want power to have revelation and walk in the power of God, you've got to pray in the Holy Ghost. So he says right here in this translation, it says in verse 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And, I, and Jesus had said, take this yoke upon you. And I said, okay, I, I take that yoke upon me, Lord, and I, I want to have your mind. And, and it says, who being, in the, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So I said, well, I, praise the Lord, that's wonderful. Then I'm equal with God because that's the mind that Jesus had. So God... I didn't do it myself. Jesus raised me up to be seated in heavenly places with Him in Christ Jesus. Spiritually, that's where I'm at. So I said to the Lord, I said, well, that's wonderful, Lord. I, I want to let this mind be. I will let this mind be in me. I'm just going to be like Jesus. And then Jesus spoke to me, and He said, what makes you think that verse 6 is what I was talking about through the Apostle Paul when it came to verse 5. He said, when it came to verse 5, said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What made you think that I was talking about verse 6? I said, because they're together. He said, I know, but verse, chapter, verse 4 is with it too. See, they didn't write in verses back in those days. They just wrote a letter. So let's read the verse that's above that in verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Stop looking at your own life and look at the life of everybody around you. If you're depressed over your life, it's because you're focused on your life and you're not focused on the life of anybody else. You're looking at, not, at, not at others and their needs. Now, I want you to notice that it says also, look not every man on the things, on his own things, but every man also. So God isn't saying you can't look at your own life and say, Lord, this is where I'm at and I need some things. It says, but stop looking at your own life only and look at the lives of all of humanity that's around you. Start looking at the body of Christ. Start saying, what is the need of the body of Christ? What's the need of my pastor? What's the need of my brother and my sister? What's the need of my father and my mother? What's the need of uh, uh, people that are around me? What's their need? Let this mind. See, Jesus had a mindset that he didn't come down here to be served. He came down here to serve others. Amen. Servitude of the heart. Boy, I love how the interlinear puts this. I want you to listen to this really carefully. Because the interlinear was the original way that the Greek and the Hebrew were, were written. And in the Greek, the interlinear says this. This... Let mine be in you, which also in Christ was. Verse 6 says, Who in form of God existing, listen to this, Who in form of God existing, not something to be grasped. Man, I 
I about jumped out of my skin when I read that. Who in form of God was. He, in who, he was in the form of God existing, and then he came, but this wasn't when he was in heaven, this is when he was on the earth. So yeah, but he was virgin born. I have news for you. You're born again. You're spirit born just as much as Jesus was spirit born. When you get born again, again, you were born physical, but when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life and you get born again, you are a spirit man and God lives in your spirit with you You're just as much as God's spirit was Jesus' spirit. Man, who in form of God existing, the mind that God wants you to get is that my spirit man is in the form of God and it's existing with God. But, it goes ahead to say, not something to be grasped for. People get born again, and then all of a sudden they start groping and grasping and everything, and reaching out, just, well, uh, how, do I, how do I get to be like God? Well, now listen, there's a portion of you that's your human nature, that's your soul realm. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotion, your intellect, the, the flesh you that's connected to this world, your body. And it's got to get a renewal process. People that tell me, well, I got born again, and live like a devil, and keep on living like a devil, I question whether they really got born again. Because the nature of God, God existent in me, is telling me greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, and no devil in hell can make me sin. Yeah, but she just don't know that pull that them things have on me. That's why Paul said, crucify your flesh. Yes. Drive the nail in it. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. I want to show you something. I don't have a pen. Hand me a pen there. Guy came up to me one day and he said, he said, brother, he said, He's smoking. Now, listen, if you smoke, I, this is not condemnation. I'm just telling you. I used to smoke two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. I'm trying to teach you a precept. He came up to me and he said, Man, he said, You're talking about this Holy Ghost business. He's, he had that cigarette and he was shaking a little bit like this while he was talking to me. He said, I, he said, I, just, I just can't shake this cigarette business. I said, Well, you, if you can if you pray in tongues. He said, Well, I pray in tongues. I said, Well, then go ahead and pray in tongues. He said, Well, not right now. Not with this cigarette in my hand, I can't. You can't put a cigarette in your mouth praying to <laughs> Oh, but that woman, she pulled on me, and I, I said, if you'd have started speaking in tongues, if you'd have started speaking in tongues, she wouldn't have let you get in the bed, that adulterous woman wouldn't have. Imagine, oh, before we get in bed, darling, I got to do something. Go, Don't tell me that you can't overcome the flesh. You still love me? You have to because you can't go to heaven if you don't. All right, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he went and he made of himself no reputation. I appreciated something Brother Copeland said. He said he was in that theater down there with Mel Tillis when Mel Tillis had that theater where we had that meeting the other night and a lady came up to him because the people were coming by and shaking hands with Brother Copeland said, oh, Brother Copeland, you know, talking to him. 
He said they were just sitting back there, you know, they weren't in any special seating or anything. People, somebody came by, this lady came up, she walked up to him and she looked him up and she, she said, you somebody? <laughs> Brother Copeland goes, no, I'm nobody. She said, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> just walked away. We're nobody. We're nobody. But we're somebody in Jesus. Look with me here. He made himself no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. We sang a song about the cross. Let me tell you something. A lot of people have forgotten about the cross. Yes, it was in the power of the resurrection that we get our power, and I understand that. But there's the power of the cross, and the Apostle Paul said, Therefore I take up my cross. Jesus said, If you don't take up a cross, what is the cross? The cross is the cross that keeps your flesh crucified. If you don't crucify your flesh, nobody else is going to. People come, a lady came to me and she said, Oh, would you just pray that I wouldn't be in the flesh? I said, You want to die? If you, want, if you want to be free from the power of the flesh, you've got to crucify the flesh. Let me tell you what it shows us in the Word of God here. In being fashioned in the man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. What is the power of the cross? The power of the cross is so amazing. The verse above it in verse 7 says, And in the form of a servant. That word is the word metaphor, metaphorical dulo in the Greek language. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from. How many of you think butterflies are just beautiful? Aren't they just, you, you'll just think butterflies are just pretty, you know? But we look at worms and we step on them. At one time in our life, we were all worms. We were worms. Unworthy of God's love in the natural. I can't even conceive how that Jesus... God, creator of all the ends of the earth, chose to come down and get in the form of a worm. Man, it just blows me away. And some of you feel pretty wormy about yourself at times in your life. And the reason you feel wormy is because you haven't created the process of the metamorphosis. The worm doesn't think he can fly, because he can't. And the worm gets to a state in his life, and all of a sudden he goes, it's time for me to die. It's time that I cease to be a worm. I've got to die. And there's a drive inside of this thing, and he goes, I know I've got to die. So what he does is he goes to work. And he begins to create what we call a chrysolite or a cocoon. And he gets in there, and this is the word that Paul chose to use when he wrote these verses of Scripture. And he, he gets this process, and he begins to form a chrysolite or a cocoon that he's about to get inside of. And that cocoon that he creates around him is this thing right here that you and I hold in our hand. If you're holding a Bible, this is your cocoon. Amen. Are you listening to me? Yeah. This and praying in the Holy Ghost is your cocoon. And what that worm does is he climbs inside. He gets inside of this cocoon and he seals himself up in that cocoon. And that cocoon 
That cocoon that he's on the inside of, he can't see anything else around him. And inside of every cocoon is a glistening mirror, whether you know it or not. And that worm gets in there and he can't see. He's not afraid of the birds that are out there, the fowl of the air that are going to try and eat. And, and that cocoon works as a protection around him so that the birds can't even see him. Let me tell you something. The devil is like the fowl of the air. And when they're trying to hunt, hunt you down, if you'll hide yourself in the cocoon of the Word of God, the devil can't see you where you're at. And he hides himself in this cocoon and pretty soon his body dies. His body dies. His flesh turns to liquid. But the inner core of that caterpillar is still alive. And he begins to eat his own flesh. <laughs> I love this. He eats his own flesh up. Well, how do you eat your own flesh? Well, Isaiah, the 41st chapter, says that God has given you a mouth. And I'm going to tell you something. The greatest mountain in your life is not the mountains that are all around you in your life. The greatest mountains that are around you is your flesh that you're going to have to speak to and cause it to become dead and consume it and get rid of it in your life so that you suddenly one day and suddenly this caterpillar, he's eaten all of his own flesh inside of this cocoon to the point that all of a sudden he starts looking in that glassy mirrored image and all of a sudden he he starts looking around inside that cocoon, slight movements, and he starts seeing, hey, I got wings, baby! Woo! And pretty soon he's going, whoa, look at these colors. Whoa! I don't feel so wormy after all. And then all of a sudden, he eats his way out. He eats his way out. And you can't convince that caterpillar that he's a caterpillar anymore. Because he's not a caterpillar anymore. He is a new creation. And he is a glorious creation. And he takes his wings and he lets the breeze of the Spirit dry those wings to the point that all of a sudden he's going, hey, I can fly. He doesn't think, oh, I'm going to fall. I fell once before when I was up on a tree as a worm. He never once ever thinks about that. He hasn't got that nature anymore. The nature of the worm is gone from him. The nature of the butterfly is on him. And all of a sudden, he spreads those wings out, and he begins to fly. And his sole purpose, his sole purpose is to sow seed. Sow his seed. Reproduce. 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 If you're a butterfly in Jesus Christ, your whole soul purpose in life, your whole focus should be, I'm going to reproduce what I was into the caterpillars maybe. Yes, but then I'll draw them. I'll help them get cocooned. And I'll let them understand they can become butterflies and fly too. Praise God. Go ahead. Give Jesus a clap offering. So, it says right here, and go back to Philippians again. And being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, verse 9, God has also highly exalted, also, also, oh, 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 oh I love this word also, I find it more and more and more, and God has also 
highly exalted him. Well, God has high also. Well, who else did he also exalt? Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. He didn't just exalt Jesus. He exalted you and I. Praise God. He was the firstborn. We're after that. He has raised us up with him. His mighty arm just didn't raise him from the dead. His mighty arm raised all of us from the dead. Praise God in the spirit realm. Raised us up to be seated with him. Wherefore God also highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. God doesn't get exalted when you say, His name is wonderful and my name is mud. God doesn't get any glory out of that. I was walking down the hallway of a mall in a mall in Rochester, New York with a friend of mine a lot of years ago. I'd been preaching in Buffalo and in Rochester area, and I mean the fire of God had fallen in those places and we were just so wound up and God was just doing such great things. And I was walking down with an old college friend of mine that I'd been ministering to trying to get him to really commit his life to Christ. And we're walking down through the mall together, and this great big tall guy comes walking down the mall toward us. He gets to about right here from where that brother's sitting in the gray shirt right there from me. And all of a sudden, he looks at me, and his eyes flared back in his head, and he said, I know you! I know you! Ah! And he took off running down the mall. And Orrin, who stuttered, he went, I said, oh, it's just the devil. <laughs> if you're really in Jesus, he's given you a name. The seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts, they tried to cast demons out of people. And they couldn't do it. And those seven sons of Sceva said, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, we adjure you, you come out of him. And they said, Well, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but who are you? But listen, it should never be that way. I have people call me. I got a telephone call that when I get back to Colorado, somebody's asking us to come and cast the devil out of somebody. I said, Tell them to go cast the devil out themselves. They've got the name of Jesus Christ. They're born again. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. Go cast the devil out of them yourself. If you know Jesus and you're born again and you got a relationship with God and you've hid yourself in Christ and you're cocooned with the power of God and you've come out of there and you've spread your wings, you have a name that the devils tremble at. Don't go walking around. Well, you know, the devil will hear you saying that. What do you think about that? Sometimes I think we're like the little old man standing up there in heaven. A great whole crowd full of people just lined up as far as you could see. And Peter had said, I want all of you husbands and wives to stand in line together. And they all stood in line, straight line. They went forever and ever and ever, all these people. He said, now all of you men who were henpecked while you were on the earth, I want you to step over to this side. And all of you men who were the boss of your house, you step over here. And every man stepped over to this side except one little old tiny scrawny guy about this tall. And he steps over and you got this big tall wife. And Peter walks up to him and he goes, wow, I want to shake your hand. You mean tell me you were the boss when you were on the earth? You were awesome. You mean you're the boss? He said, no, not really. My wife just told me where to stand. <laughs> My wife just said to me, stand over here. I thought she was serious. <laughs> and that's how some of us have treated Satan after we've been born again. Satan is not all powerful. The Bible says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me, and I've given you the keys of the kingdom. Therefore, you go out and you cast the devil out. But the reason that the body of Christ isn't doing what they're supposed to do is because we're not into the deep, deep water yet. Now, we got the deep, deep water in us. 
Go over to Ezekiel the, real quickly. I'm gonna, how, how, what time am I supposed to close? Right now? Yes. Somebody said yes? yes. Oh, oh. Go, over to, go over to the book of Ezekiel real quickly. I'm going to try and close out here. But I, I, I want to get this through to you. I want you to start seeing who you are. Let me tell you something. You'll stop sinning when you start believing who God made you to be. You'll start living in victory when you start seeing who God said for you to be. Let me tell you, I know for a fact how this works because I had a wife who died of cancer because she could never see herself in the light that God had made her in. She could pray for other people and they'd get healed. She'd do the works of God and people would get translated into the power of God and, and blind eyes would open and deaf ears would hear. And she would get, those things were working for her, but they weren't working for her in her own life because she couldn't see it took me the longest time. I said, why did she die? And the Lord said, because she couldn't get an image of who I said she was. She knew who I was to everybody, but she couldn't believe that she was that special person, overcomer in her own life. She'd been abused. I don't care if you've been abused. Listen. That wasn't you that was abused. If you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away, all things are become new. Stop living in the past. Here in the book of Ezekiel in the 47th chapter, look with me at it. Ezekiel 47. Verse 40, chapters 47, verse 1. And I'm not going to take a whole long time to preach all this. I'm just going to go really, really, I'm going to go like lightning speed really fast here. But I'm going to lay a foundation for the first few words. And afterwards he brought me again. I read that and the Lord said, did you notice what it said there? I started to read it and I hear the other day I was starting to read that over and he said, read that real slow. And I said, Afterward, he said, not that slow. <laughs> Afterward, he brought me again. And the Lord said, stop. The whole book of, of Ezekiel is filled with him being at the house, the door of the Lord. Whole lots of things took place. But he hits this spot and it says, And afterwards he brought me again unto the door of the house. You can't just come once into the presence of God. Old Pentecost used to say, Well, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost in 1947. And boy, I tell you, it was glorious. And it was glorious for me. July the 25th at 12.05 a.m. in the morning, 1971, was glorious. I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, and I talked in tongues for three days. But I can't camp back where what was, because what was is no longer, because faith is not was, and faith is not will be. Faith is now. Everybody say now. So that means that this morning when I got up and Ann and I were praying in the Holy Ghost in our motel room, we had to get now. And right this minute, I'm still having to get now. And right now while I'm preaching to you, I'm having to talk to you out of the now. I'm not talking to you out of the past, and I'm not talking to you into the future. I'm talking to you about the now. One time I was in my church, and, I, and, and I'd been out preaching in different places, and I came back to my church, and I was real tired, and I got up at about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I thought, Lord, I don't have a message ready to preach to my congregation. What shall I preach? And he was silent about it. So I ran to one, my file cabinet. I had a, about 600 messages, and that's not an exaggeration, 600 messages in my file cabinets. And I pulled those file cabinets open and I started through there and I thought, ooh, that was a good one. I remember that. And I slapped it up there and then I went a little farther and I, oh, that was really a good one. And I whap and I slapped that one up there and the Lord spoke to me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to find a message, Lord. You, since you aren't speaking to me to give me a message, I'm trying to find a message. And 
And all of a sudden, he said to me, the people in that building, my sheep are yours. I said, oh, sir, I won't, I'm not going to be shot as a sheep stealer. They're yours. He said, that's right. They're mine. That's when I got freed about whether they left or stayed, brother, because I realized they belonged to him. I said, they're yours. He said, then I take it real personal what my sheep get fed. And I don't want your old manna. Well, Lord, would you just give me some fresh manna? He said, we'll pray in the Holy Ghost for the next couple hours before your service then. That's the best message I ever preached. Amen. And I don't have any of the notes off of it. And again, you're going to have to get your manna from God every single day. If we're going to live this last hours, and my friends, listen to me, I believe we're in the last hour. I believe we're getting into the last hours because I believe that the world is getting worse than it has ever been. But I also believe that the church is going to shine more glorious than it has ever shined. Praise God. And I believe we're going to go out of here with a flame of glory like you have, like a, we used, I used to ra run around with funny cars, you know, and I'm telling you, we, we were supposed to just use bleach burnouts on the funny cars, and we once in a while get some flame fuel in there with that, you know, and all of a sudden the fire would come up off the wheels and it'd make your wheels hotter so you could go better. I believe we're going to do a flame burner out of here when we leave this planet, man. I mean, God's going to take His church out of here with fire. Can you say amen? So notice with me what it goes ahead to say. I'm going to hurry really quick now. Jump ahead with me. He said, it brought me again. Well, I don't have time to go through all of these. But he talks about water coming out from under the gates. And in verse 4 he says, And he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. And the waters, well, wait a minute, I missed, missed the first one. Verse, verse 3, And when the man had that line in his hand and went eastward and measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. And then he brought me through another thousand, and they were to the knees. And then he brought me through another thousand, and they were to the loins. And then he brought me out, another, and said he measured another thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass, in verse 5, I could not pass over, for the waters were risen. A river that could not be passed over. The word over is not in the original Hebrew. A river that could not be passed. Jesus said in John the 8th chapter verse 38, He said, And out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. When you and I get so full of God's Holy Spirit every single day, day after day after day. Let me tell you something. If you're only thigh deep, if you're only loin deep right now in the things of God, you can be ankle deep if you want to, but you're still standing on your own strength. When you get knee deep, you're standing on your own strength. When you get loin deep, you're standing on your own strength. But when you get into the deep places of God so deep, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen You'll be in water so deep that you can't pass over it. It will drown you. It'll drown you in the anointing of God Amen. so powerfully. And all of a sudden, what will happen? You won't, you'll, be part, you'll become the water. And let me tell you what will happen next. Jump ahead with me. You can read this whole chapter, it'll bless you. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass that everything that lives, which moves. If you're alive in Jesus and you're not moving, you're stagnant water. And the thing is, it says, in every prayer that the water shall come, and everything that it touches will live. I'm telling you, we're going to come to the point, Brother Caps, I believe with all of my heart, we're coming to an hour right now when everybody in the body of Christ is going to make a determination. It's a determination we got to make. And we're going to get so out there in the presence of God, we're going to get, and the world's going to think we're crazy as bats. I don't care what the world thinks anymore. We're going to get out there, and we're going to get so full of the fire of God, and so filled with the water of the Word, and we're going to be so under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, 
Ghost, the whole body, not just a few of us, the whole body, and all of a sudden this great river of anointing is going to raise up, and suddenly what's going to happen is it's going to lift us. We're not going to be drowned. We're going to be lifted up. We're going to be lifted up. Everybody say, we're going to be lifted up. up. Notice what it says in the rest of this verse. Wherever the rivers shall come, they shall live. In other words, there's living that's going on. And there shall be a great multitude of fish. (laughs) Fish are people, my friends. Listen to me. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. And there's going to be such a draw of fish that's coming into the kingdom of God. Because the water shall come there, for they shall be healed. Praise God. Amen. The lives of people are going to begin to be healed because it's going to come out of us. It'll, you say, well, I don't think it can come out of me. You're right, it can't. That's because you're, you're not willing to get into the water so deep with God. Here's, here's something that i got to tell you, and I'm going to finish with this in, the, in a couple of seconds. You know what that means to a preacher when he says, I'm going to finish with that? means I'm going to go another 35 minutes. No, no, I'm not going to go another 35 minutes. The death process is a fearful thing to the flesh. It's not to your spirit, man, if you're born again. We pass from death into life when we get born again, and that's all the dying I'm ever going to do. They can't kill me because I'm alive. They kill this body that I'm inside of, but they can't kill me. They can't kill you if you're in Christ. And what happens is we get so full of God, we get so full of His fire and His anointing and His power, and suddenly that anointing doesn't leave us. See, sometimes we go, well, if I get out there in that deep water, I'm going to drown. Yeah, you will. But when you drown, you're no longer alive in your own ability any longer. And all of a sudden, God takes you and He lifts you up. And you're not drowned in the water any longer. You're standing on the water. Notice what it says in the next portion of this verse right here. It'll knock your hat in the water. And if you don't have a hat, get one and throw it in the water. And it shall come to pass that the fishers will stand upon it. Verse 10. Wherever the water comes is going to heal. And the fishers, people who are fishermen, are going to stand upon the anointing. And it says, even unto, I don't have time to go into these two words. Look them up in the Hebrew. It will bless your life. In Gidai and in Gileam. And they shall be places to spread forth their nets. Their fish shall be according to their kind as the fish of a great sea exceeding many exceeding many brother exceeding many exceeding many exceeding many I'm going to say it again. Exceeding many. Exceeding many. Come on. That ain't no small amount. It ain't a small amount. No. There's revival. We're in for the greatest harvest of souls. That any generation has ever seen. You millennials, you Z generation people, listen to me. You're in for the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. If you are willing to give up your life for the life of God, and you're willing, any of us in here, I don't know, my wife tells me i got to live to 120 years, so i got a long ways to go yet. And I believe for exceeding many. When Jesus showed me a harvest back in 1975, He said, You see all of these souls? 
I said, yes, sir. It was worldwide. You see all these souls? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're going to get to be a part of harvesting all of these souls. And I was blown away because it was exceeding many. I said, how's that possible, Lord? He, I said, I'm not questioning you, Lord. I just, just, you know, they called me Silly Jimmy. He said, you're not. You begin to see yourself who I say you are. Cocoon yourself. Get into the deep. Drown yourself in the anointing of my spirit. Because nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Nothing is impossible. Come on, say it. Say it with me. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. If you'll believe. Yeah, but that, uh, I, 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 no, no, no. Not, uh, not about I, I, I. It's about him, him, him. You all stand up on your feet, please. Did the Spirit of God challenge your soul today? Everybody, if you would, please, put your hand on your heart. If you're in this place and you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you can't enter into where I'm talking about. But God has you in mind. If you're not born again, you never ask Jesus to be the Lord. See, it's, it's not a matter of walking down an aisle. and It's not a matter about shaking hands with a preacher. It's not about getting plunged into water. It's not about being confirmed as a baby. It's not a, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with Jesus said, if you'll make me Lord. And if you'll make Jesus Lord, your whole life will be changed. You'll enter into life and life more abundantly. Somebody said, well, I'm a, I got a real kind of a fun life. No, you got a miserable life. I live there. I know. If you haven't ever made Jesus Lord of your life, there's no joy. There's, though it, there may be temporary funs, F-U-N. There might be temporary F-U-N, but I guarantee you what, there's not joy, unspeakable, and filled with the life of God. And if you want that today, you can have that today. Because Jesus said, Whosoever calls on my name shall be saved. Boy, I'm convinced that Jesus meant what he said, and he said what he meant. He said, Anybody who calls on my name, they'll be saved. So if that's you this morning, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, Jesus wants you to be saved today. But then the rest of us in here that are already saved and those of you who are about to ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, there's a step now that you need to make. And that is you need to transition your existence where you are into becoming who heaven says you are. Amen. You need to stop living like the old man. He's dead. You don't have to live in that old man. You start living like Jesus intended you to live. And I guarantee you what, you'll never in all of eternity regret the moment that you made a decision. Lord, is it scary at times? You better believe it is. In the flesh, it's scary. Your flesh will say, well, I, 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 I can't do that. I, you're right, you can't do it. But I guarantee you what, the life of God inside of you can cause you to become who God says you are. I'm telling you, if you're sick in your body today, the life of God says you are healed in heaven. God sees you on this planet as healed. He doesn't see you as sick. He doesn't see you as poverty ridden. He sees you as prosperous. There's no. How many of you believe there's any poverty in heaven? How many of you believe there's any sickness in heaven? Well, the Bible prays, Jesus' prayer was, Father, let it be on the earth like it is in heaven. That's, right. That's His will. So with everybody's hand on your heart, I want to lead you in a prayer. If this is your first time to ever pray like this and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I want you to come up after I finish praying this prayer. I want you to make a beeline for me after the service is over with and tell me I prayed that prayer today because I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to rejoice with you so much that your life has been given to Christ. Let's all put up one hand to Jesus, one on our heart, if you can do that. Let's all say together, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I give my whole life to you as Lord and Savior. And I'm rejoicing that you are receiving me just like I'm receiving you. 
And I give my whole life to follow you from this day forward. I'll never be the same. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, I'm going to make a determination to see myself just like I am in the heaven realms. I'm going to begin to say what you say. I'm going to do what you want done. And in the name of Jesus, no power of the flesh, no power of the devil will ever be able to stop me because my life is hid in Christ. And I'm going to continue on with you, Jesus. This is my decision. And I'm going forward. And I expect to be full of your Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, going forward under the anointing of God to defeat the devil and bring multitudes into the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him a shout offering and a clap offering. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. If you meant what you said, God is going to take your life and you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same from this moment forward. You say, will I have any battles? You bet. But Jesus is your yoke together with you. And I guarantee you, every battle you will go through, you won't, may not have, you'll have to go through some. But every battle you go through, you will come out on the other triumphant as long as you stay in the deep, deep water, praying in the Holy Ghost, holding on to the hand of Jesus. Look at the people around you and say, you are absolutely the very best God has got. You're absolutely the very best God has got, my brother.